<laughs> Stop looking at me. Jess is here today, folks, and uh, she's a very distracting presence behind the camera. As soon as I start filming, she starts giggling. But today, we are focusing on the hotbed, finally. Uh, we've got a bit of time this Sunday, so I've brought Jess down to give me a bit of help. And we're going to knock this together. If you're not familiar with the principles of hotbed, I will link a fantastic book by Jack First, which is where I got the idea from. Uh, Steve Greenside Up kind of introduced us to it. He's done loads of collaborations recently with Hugh Richards, so he doesn't need too much help from me, but I will link it because it's a fantastic kind of introduction to the process. And what we're doing here is trying to build the smallest scale possible kind of hotbed in the polytunnel. Now this hotbed is, to be honest, a bit of an experiment. We're breaking a lot of the rules. Like I just said, we're doing it on a much smaller scale. And the idea is basically you have a heat generating reservoir at the base, which is gonna be mostly horse manure for me. But then on top, and this is a bit that confuses a lot of people, above this layer of heat generating composting material, you need a growing medium. So for that, I'm gonna be using spent compost. And I think we're gonna aim for around six inches. So the seeds that you sow in here can get their roots away. If they went straight into the horse manure as it was composting, they would not be very happy. So what you need to do is above your layer of horse manure, build a frame. And that's where the, the hot frame comes in. So when you see cold frames, for the longest time I wondered why they were called cold frames, because normally they act like a miniature greenhouse. But it's because the alternative to a cold frame is a hotbed frame. And so I found a few bits of wood lying around the plots so that I've got a cut to size. I'm gonna kind of keep it to just one bay in the polytunnel, cut this to size, go two up on the back, we'll knock it together, see how it looks, and then start to get it properly filled with not only uh, horse manure, but I've got some, some leaves as well from the cherry trees, which will help to just kind of balance it out a little bit because a lot of this manure is quite wet and the leaves are nice and dry. So just help things all break down a little bit. There's lots in Jack First's book about the different materials you can use to get a hotbed going, the different kinds of manure and the good mixes of kind of carbon to nitrogen to look for. You're not going to do it by eye. Let no, me get your tape measure. Measuring. There's a tape measure in the bag somewhere. Where, Where is it? it? No, the two, the two bits of wood just need to be the same length. That's this all. Bit of wood and, that bit of wood at the back. and the two bits of wood at the back. So while Jess is uh, doing a bit of measuring, a bit of sawing, cutting those things to size, I am going to see if I can get rid of all the nails that are in this random bit of timber I found. I've got, you know, stacks of timber whenever I see it. It gets piled up by the shed and every now and then you find a use for it. So this is full of stuff. We'll see if they come out. And the idea is that's going to be the, the bits in the corners, you know, that you attach all the wood into instead of using metal brackets. That actually worked a bit better than I thought it was going to. I'm just going to cut this to size now. Two shorter ones for the front bits, two longer ones for the back, and then you can just screw the wood into this. And uh, one of the things that people normally do with their kind of frames is have them so that they're removable. You know, later on in the year when I've got my tomatoes and my chilies and that kind of thing, I'll just find somewhere to put the, put the frame at the back of the shed or something like that, and then you get it back out for spring and hotbed season. So that's another reason to maybe build it on a slightly smaller side. If you, if you go slightly too big, then it can be a bit tricky to, to move around the plot and that kind of thing. Jess wanted me to demonstrate her perfect cutting skills. Thank you. <laughs> now, what I am thinking is, this is just the experimental one, and if it, if it works really well, and I think it's, you know, the bee's knees and I want to do this properly, I might do this with um, some of the spare scaffolding boards I've got. But for now, I'm just going to use this kind of scrap, scrap wood. And what I'm going to do as well, because this stuff is only thin, it's been around a while. I think it might have been raised beds somewhere. There's a light bit of rot. Um, you know, this wouldn't last years and years. So I'm going to cover this with uh, compost bags just to give it that little bit of extra longevity. Um, and then in the future, you know, if we really want to scale this up or do more, then um, maybe some slightly more robust, chunky wood that's going to last a bit longer. Now, this is probably the simplest way to attach two bits of wood, but I always, always do this wrong. I always forget to offset. Um, so quite often, I'll offer up two bits, I'll get this and go right to the edge. And it's always just so easy to forget how you're doing it. You either want that there or you want it on the outside, but just remember that and stay consistent. So for this, I want it slightly less wide. 
so the shorter piece is going to overlap nicely. Oh, there's a bloody screw. Okay, I didn't think this through. Probably should have done this one first and then moved it into position. Help? Yeah, please. Would you just kind of, um, we'll just put it upright. Where are the long bits? Those two. Um, so if we put those in first and then it'll sort of, should kind of hold itself together, you know? Yeah. So these are going to go on top of each other like this. So this one mm. I will put here. Yeah. And then drill through it and screw into it. Now, this is the bit where I was saying about the offset. So this is going to have to come in. Bugger. So why don't we? Have you got another, like, offcut? Uh, all the offcuts are outside. My knees are even with these. Ah, oh, ah, 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 ah. In hindsight, I am wishing that uh, maybe we had just done this measured outside. <laughs> There's too much stuff in the poly tunnel. And now we've kind of got to the position where this is about the best place we can do it. And we're just going to have to stand on the bed, which is not ideal. In fact, I might actually get some, get some wood. Because look, we've said it on camera now, Jess. We're going to... Now we've got to get wood. Yeah, to like lay down. So you're not putting all your weight on one bit. We're going to have to just stand on the bed. It's not <laughs> ideal, but there's, <laughs> there's nothing lying around. So, you know, forgive me, forgive me. Please don't comment saying, JP, you shouldn't be standing on your bed. I know, but we're tired, my knees hurt. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to do it. Why don't we flip it up? Flip what up, my love? So put this bit on the floor and do it that way. Jess has had a wacky idea. We've gone upright. Yeah, and then we do all of the holes at the same time. So we'll You're the boss, tell me what to do. I'll hold it in place, <laughs> and we're going to do all the holes, then we're going to do all the screws. So you get your side into position. Mm -hmm. My side is also in position. Right, now. You're not get, now going to have to go inside and hold up one of the brackets. Yeah? This like is this? not the... <laughs> like this? Yeah. I don't think this is going to work, Jess. Yeah, I, I see we need a, uh, an octopus no. with more hands. No. How many do you want? One here, one here? <laughs> or one, two, three? Just do two. Let's do two. We just really need it to hold. We do just need it to hold. Well, this... <laughs> it would be fine if the ground was supporting it, but because we are doing it like this, I've got to stand here. So it looks like it's going to split with the second screwdriver in it, but... What's going to split? That way, but... Is that encouraging? <laughs> Keep going, your way. Yeah, just let go. You're fine. I don't want it to hit this. That's not bad. Could be worse. So it looks okay. We're not doing proper lights because it's in a polytunnel. Lights is the name for uh, the, the top frame that you would normally have on a cold frame, you know, with the polythene or the polycarbonate or what have you. So the compost bags, I'm going pretty rough and ready. It's a lot more kind of controlled moisture in the polytunnel. You know, I can make sure that stuff's, stuff's only really gonna get wet in here when I'm watering. So it's not like I'm worried about trapping moisture in here in the same way that I would be with rain coming in. So I'm just covering this whole lot. Very roughly. I've trailed this all the way down into the bed as well, and I'm hoping what it's going to do just a little bit is help with that heat retention instead of the manure losing it to the soil. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it might not help that much, but it might help a little bit. This isn't exactly watertight either. I mean, compost bags have holes in, but it's just to, you know, stop the moisture from the manure or the compost getting straight into the... This is great as well, because if you make any mistakes in the timber, you just cover it up. Cover it up with the compost bags. I think this plastic looks pretty heavy duty. Compost kind of bags can come in different grades, but this stuff looks like it should be fine. I know it's not the most eco of things to use, but I think it's better than 
Get me in the landfill. That is that. It's, it's, it could be a bit more level, but might raise it up a little bit and then this extra little overhang with the plastic should be really good for keeping all the manure in. Just time to load it up, load it up. Ah, there we go. It's not perfect. It's a, pre it's a pretty JB effort, to be honest. Just kind of tried to knock this together. The sizing is all a bit off. It's all a bit funky, but I've just used what I've had around. You know, this has cost nothing. The horse manure was got for free. Um, not by me, I should say, by an, an allotment friend. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it keeps us all very well supplied. But one thing to mention, if you are doing this with horse manure, you want to try and get something with a lot of straw and a lot of horse bedding mixed in with the manure. Basically, because that's going to contain a lot of horse urine, which is a bit gross, but that is vital to this process, which is biological. It is the hot composting process that generates the heat is, it comes from bacteria, and you need to get the mix quite, quite right. I don't know if I've got quite enough horse bedding in here, which is why I've gone for quite a lot of the dry leaf, the carbon. Hopefully that's going to help it a little bit. As the process does start to kick off and this starts to put out heat, it should sink quite a lot. So I've come up a little bit higher than the planting level. The, the compost level should really start at the bottom of the frame. Um, that's the idea here with what I've got anyway. Um, and this should start to sink down quite a lot. So we'll, we should still have quite a lot of room. The other thing, as well as looking for something with a nice amount of straw and bedding mix, is make sure you've got something that's been tested for herbicide. Uh, Menopyralid is the main thing, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, that is really persistent in horse manure and it will basically kill everything in your soil for like three years. So make sure you avoid it, make sure you're only getting stuff from a trusted stable or you know paddock or whatever. Uh, the timing of this, we are really late. So this is going to take two or three weeks to really start cooking if the mix is right. Um, and then we can start planting. This is kind of, we're early Feb now, what is it, 11th today, so it's not ideal. This is gonna be getting hot in March, which is when everything's really starting to warm up anyway, but this should be an ideal frost-free environment, so we can plant things in here which aren't hardy. If you get it going early, then you can get a first crop of loads of early stuff, like uh, spring onions, radishes, and all that kind of thing in February. You know, you can be growing in this now. And obviously, if you've got the lights properly on, a proper lid that's gonna keep everything retained. Like I say, I've kind of forgone that, <laughs> just because effort, to be completely honest with you. I've not had much time to get this done properly, but because it's in the polytunnel, it's already naturally kind of quite insulated from temperature swings. Ventilation is also really important, depending on what horse manure you're mixing, how composted down it is. You want it fresh because if it's already, I can, oh, I can feel the heat coming off this. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. So some of this has started to compost down already in the bag. So that's a really good sign because that means there's a good mix of stuff. And now it's all in here with all this intensity, it should really start cooking. I was thinking about maybe laying some tarp over this to get the, the, the heat in, but I think the ventilation is really key. Because we're in a polytunnel, I don't want it to get too humid. I've got vents in my doors, which I think is ideal. If you were doing this in a completely closed polytunnel, the whole thing would become completely humid. You might be killing off a lot of, a lot of your early crops or anything that you've got planted in here. It might be too humid. Um, and the other reason you want ventilation is just because it bongs. It's quite whiffy when you've got all of this mixed up, especially if it's quite wet. Um, and this is quite wet, so just beware of ventilation. I think that is about all the advice I can give you. If you have more questions, then the person to turn to is Jack First. Spend a few quid, get his book. It's a really, really interesting thing. It goes into a lot of the history of this method of growing. They used to do it on an industrial scale in France. He is as well on Instagram, so if you have any questions, you can ask him a few on there. Thank you ever so much for watching. I hope you found this at least entertaining, if not useful. An extra special thank you to all of my patrons and especially my Chili Pepper Tier patrons, Tony, Bill, Pam, Louise, Mel, Michael, Denise, Socks in the Garden, Andrew and Sarah. Hopefully, I'll see you again next time.